This is episode number 44 of DevOps Paradox with Darren Pope and Victor Farsik. I'm Darren. And I'm Victor. Now, Victor's been on the road. We're, we're time traveling again. Mm-hmm. He's been on the road for two weeks, even though you just heard the podcast last week. So we actually haven't talked for two weeks. And one of the recurring themes that he heard, and I hear a lot, is we can't do cloud, fill in the blank. Everything we do has to be on premise. And in today's world of Kubernetes, I'll say it, that sounds pretty insane. So assuming that there is even a remote option to go to cloud, I would never run my Kubernetes on-prem simply because it's hard. And why would they do that? You know, so let's start with why, why not pay somebody to make sure that that Kubernetes is running and somebody who knows very well how to do that, like Google or Amazon or Azure, right? Running Kubernetes is not anybody's business or almost anybody's business. Let, let somebody else take care of that. And on top of that, you don't get the real ben- all the real benefits of Kubernetes. Kind of. How do you, you cannot scale your cluster when it's on-prem. Assume that you, can, you don't have a magic wand and say, uh, materialize more servers, right? So it's not scalable, it's complicated, and uh, just trouble for no obvious reason. The only reason I know of, and we can talk about others later, but the only the only reason somebody might be able to convince me that cloud is not an option would be Europe, because all cloud providers, I mean all big three, are US based. And even if their data centers are in Europe, data protection law might not they would they might not be able to uh, apply data pro- European protection laws because U.S. government theoretically could request that data, even even though it's not physically in U.S. Now this is I'm not rumbling now between different countries and stuff like that, but that's the only valid reasons reason I I heard. I I think that's true, and even with um, whatever happened in California, which is very similar to GDPR, uh, I believe we're going to start seeing more of that in the U.S. But let, let's go back one step. We were talking about magically materialize more servers. Yeah. You sort of you sort of said that. I did. Now, one thing that I've started seeing recently, which it's it it, it always things ha- tend to happen in clusters. You drive along, you don't see any red cars, and then all of a sudden you see three red cars. One of the clusters I've seen recently, and not a bad cluster, an, an interesting cluster is I'm starting to see OpenStack pop its head back up again. And OpenStack gives you that capability as long as you actually have the underlying capacity. Yeah, so when I say you cannot really scale on-prem, it's not true because both on-prem and, and any cloud provider have a limited capacity. Nobody can do magic. But I'm yet to see somebody setting up clusters, in plural, on-prem, when they're real elastic and then one cluster is uh, gets reduced capacity and so that it frees the space for another cluster that needs it more. So y- you could do it. I just never saw on-prem cluster that is truly elastic. Sorry, clusters in plural. Right. And I think the reason why is uh, unless you're somebody that is that doesn't let's let's go back to the European or the California rules. You can't use cloud because of paranoia. I'll call it that or legal, which sometimes is the same thing. You would have to have, you would have to employ a certain skill set that is probably more valuable right now than somebody that knows how to program COBOL on the mainframe, because to to have somebody that has the skill set, that not only does it in a single data center, but if you're a large company, you're going to have multiple data centers and probably not from a a straight DR perspective, but a active active perspective, it's going to be an interesting problem to solve, but the skill sets to solve those problems goes well beyond. Can you write hello world? Oh, way beyond, way beyond. There are, there is a small percentage of people who can do that really well. And here comes the, problematic part 
they're not going to work for you. They're likely not going to work for you. And this is not, I'm not trying, very often I'm offensive, I recognize that, but this is really now, I'm being honest. You're not, most likely you're not getting the top talent. Because top talent is working in somewhere else, in Amazon and Google and uh, Netflix. So unless you're one of those, you're not going to get that guy or that people. This is now the part why I like cloud. Actually, you can get those guys if you take it as a service. Absolutely, because with that, you, you've lost that risk. Usually the answer back to that is, well, this is proprietary to us. We're special. We need to have we need to have all the skills in house in case one of the big in case the cloud provider we pick goes away. Look, if Amazon goes away tomorrow, uh, internet is gone. I mean, if Amazon, Google, uh, so if Amazon goes away, there are no more servers, so there is no more internet. If Google goes away, there is no search, so there is no more internet, and so on and so forth. So trust me, if one of those guys go away you have much bigger problems than whether you know how to set up a cluster. Yeah, I mean, there used to be a... Now, this this may be completely incorrect, so don't quote me on this. But I remember seeing at one point that Amazon... It was either Amazon or Azure, probably both, uh, install more servers in a day than most companies will install in years. I don't have the data, but I would be very surprised if that's not true. Because they're not buying off off the shelf servers. They've got custom built servers. They've got custom built racks. I know Azure has their, you know, they have all these different cooling and different data center structures, right? That just make things more better, but yet you. You know, we'll, we'll bring up the CTO episode we had a while back. You've got a CTO that's always worked in big company and they've never been on the front side of the curve and never really had to try to uh, innovate. I, I had a client recently say, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that we do, uh, we think we're innovating, but really we're just imitating. Exactly. And even if you are lucky few who can innovate, and you're probably not, uh, really, what is it you want to innovate on? Is your business really infrastructure? So that's where you're going to innovate. You're going to be a, create better Kubernetes. You're not. Your business is whatever your business is. And most likely it is about writing some killer application, not infrastructure. I mean, so, for some companies that is a business, that's true. But for most, no. Why would you waste effort and money and, and everything or something that... It does not brings no value at all. Infrastructure is a cost. It's a necessary evil. And, and, and the problem is, is, most of the time you can't tell people that that is truth. Their their answers back will be, "Oh, it's regulation. We have to have everything on site." Or it's in the U.S. It's a HIPAA law. It's a healthcare issue. Nothing can be in the cloud. So s some of those things might be true, but more often than not, they're not. It's just that there is a a regulation somewhere, but nobody knows what it is. It's just that somebody interpreted that regulation a long time ago as you cannot be on the cloud or you cannot do this or you must do that. That's rarely the real uh, thing or at least the, the real regulation. I mean, how many regulations says uh, you need to be no regul... Is there a regulation that says that your data center needs to be up to 200 meters from your office? Is that a regulation? I would hope not. At least I never heard something like that. So you, your stuff is running on a server somewhere, and that server can be below your desk, 500 meters from it, or 2 kilometers, or 200 kilometers from you. But it's still, it's not below your desk, so it's somewhere. And then I hear those things like, Cloud, the, my favorite is cloud is not secure. You know, they have no idea what they're doing. Those guys have no idea. We know how to make things secure. That That's my favorite. That, that's just so silly that I cannot even start explaining. I, I can explain it. You want me to try? Yeah, go ahead. The way we secure our servers is we don't connect them to a network. 
oh yeah, you're right. Or we make it so secure that nobody can do anything, including our developers. Yeah, th- that's true. That 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 is truly secure. But I doubt that anybody really wants wants it to be so secure that you cannot do anything. The one scenario I, I have seen, and it, it was at a at a client, it was very interesting. Was nobody was allowed root access once once the machine was installed. Root was stripped away from everyone, including the system administrators. No sudo, no nothing else. Which that's an image at that point, or a, a template, an image, whatever you want to call it. Actually, I don't think that's such a bad idea. I think that's actually a great idea because then you can't break the freaking thing. Yeah, you can't snowflake it. The only thing is that what. What I'm observing in companies is that, yeah, nobody has root access, but we are not providing a service how you can do your stuff without root access. So kind of like, I don't know, I go on site and they say, can you help me install this? Yes, I can. Uh, Give me root access. I I will not. Is there a service? Is there any button I can click? No. And and then, yes, then it's super super secure. Nobody has root access and nothing is running. But then... Gee, doesn't that sound like what the cloud providers give you out of the box? But that that is what cloud providers give you. You don't have root access to, to their infrastructure. But there is a service to do everything you need to do. And everything happens within seconds. And we've talked about this before. Yeah. People are trying to recreate the cloud in their four walls without realizing it a lot. They're being imitators again. Because that's their job. What well, what happens with them if if you move to cloud? What happens with hundreds of people managing current infrastructure in a company? Welcome to McDonald's. Would you like fries with your order? There you go. That's the answer is yes. By the way, always say yes. <laughs> okay, so that's we went down a really dark and dreary path there. Let's let's go to the other side. Let's say there's a legitimate reason. You've got to run on premise. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll we'll say it's GDPR for right now. That's privacy. As much as we're poking fun at everybody else, privacy is a big deal. True. I'm I'm a very reasonable conspiracy theorist, if you will. I'm not tin foil, but I have some aluminum foil. <laughs> um, the way I also look at it is, I have a driver's license. I have a passport. The government already knows everything about me anyway. It's another conversation, probably. Kind of if if I would be have ambition to become a president, I would be much more concerned than I am right now. So everybody start go start googling Victor, and you'll find out all the things about Victor. Okay, so back to, back to this back to the story. Reasonable reason to go on prem happens, yes. And let's and let's keep it scoped to Kubernetes for the moment. Mm-hmm. Today's world, there are a handful of options named options we can say rancher we can say openshift mm-hmm. those are probably the two bigs i can't think of anything else off the top of my head. well docker enterprise i mean i i think that docker enterprise is, is going away uh but uh i mean all the traditional players are coming back they after after years of ignoring the situation they're realizing that Kubernetes is here to stay, so I'm seeing now PKS and and Oracle and IBM and basically all those who already have established business with companies are now uh, coming back to those companies saying, oh, I'm having a Kubernetes as well. And my Kubernetes is better simply because uh, you're already locked into my ecosystem, so why not continue being locked into my ecosystem? So use this, whatever that is. So all, all those are going, I mean, VMware is also offering something, whatever it's called. Everybody does. And and I think that their influence and their usage is going to increase, but I doubt that that will increase drastically. The only player that really matters in on-prem today, that's OpenShift, which happens to be my least favorite option. Be nice. I'm I'm nice. Look, I, I just said least favorite. I didn't start saying why. <laughs> All right, so I'll ask I'll ask this question point blank. If you had to do pure bare metal today, 
don't not Kubernetes. If you if you had an application, it was either going to go on bare metal slash virtual, or you're going to put it on OpenShift. Which would you pick? Uh, OpenShift. Okay. I'm saying it's not that bad. It's just it's no. your least favorite. It's your uh, least favorite. Uh, yeah, and it's not because it's better or worse. I mean, we can discuss that as well. But more is because it it goes. It is the one furthest away from uh, Kubernetes API. That's my problem. It's not about quality. Uh, it's about how far or close you are to to Kubernetes API. Right. There there are some abstractions that seem a little strange. My words, not Victor's. <laughs> it's not even about being strange. It's about being different. And the the main reason why I like Kubernetes is not because it runs containers, but because I acquired some Kubernetes skills, and they're equal, they're almost equally useful everywhere, except in OpenShift. Uh, so it, I, I need to invest as a lot of time to to be able to do the things that I already know how to do, or the other way around. It's more about me being lazy, not wanting to learn the same thing twice, than about quality. Yeah, I th- I think with the move towards we'll call it kubernetes right now because i I don't want to just say containerization because we talked about on the cube api episode that containers is just one part of what kubernetes can do for you yeah but as people move towards kubernetes people are having to reskill themselves or not as the case may be in a lot of places c said we have to do Kubernetes. Okay, we're going to do Kubernetes. I think one of the big things in today's world, and I see this every once in a while, not very often, it's like, oh yeah, so we've got to run on-prem and we're just going to use the baseline Kubernetes from the Kubernetes project. We we can't afford, we don't want to pay for any kind of support. Is that a bad idea or a good idea? Paying for support, I think is a good idea. I mean, I was very much against it in the past, but... I work with so many big companies that kind of that's that's peanuts money compared to how much trouble you can be in without it. Um, so I'm not against support. I'm not I'm not even against of enterprise something on top of open source. That that's all good. Uh, yeah. So why not? I mean, if if you're talking about thousands of people working in a company, why not pay support and worry a bit less? As a matter, of, uh, I mean, in a way, cl- going to cloud is also getting somebody support, which is either answering your questions or giving you some service or something like that. So, I, I'm I'm perfectly fine with with that, uh, assuming that you are big enough that that makes sense. You know, if you're having a ten people company, you're not going to buy s- support for everything. Well, you, you touched on it right there. If you go cloud. A lot of the arguments that we're talking about just sort of magically either go away or change in a different direction. Now, instead of having to pay somebody to manage my servers, it's just part of the API call. But that's kind of, I would actually say that big part of the reasons why you want to go cloud is is, is the support. And the reason why it works so well and you rarely use it is because they know exactly what you have. Because it's it's their service. I'll take it one step further. It's their business. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's it's business of uh, when you have a vendor on prem, it's it's their business as well. Uh, the problem is that when you're on prem, then you're having random things that nobody really knows how to solve from outside your company. So, so support might be a bit less effective or a lot less effective when you're on-prem because whomever is giving you that support doesn't know what you have. Well, I think with the on-prem, just because you have on, just because you have support, you're still the one operating it. Exactly. Versus cloud, they're supporting it and they're operating it. Exactly. As long as it's a real service. That's, if if you've taken and built from, we'll use AWS, if you've, if you've taken and built a bunch of EC2 instances, and you used Kube ADM to install Kubernetes, you, well, number one, you did it wrong. Number two, you've put yourself and your company in into a corner. Yeah, and AWS is not going to help you with that at all, just to make it clear, because 
they're going to help you with EC2 instances because that's what you're using. They're not going to help you with your Kubernetes problems because that's out of their SLAs. And at the end of the day, why would you even use kubeadm to run Kubernetes cluster in AWS? If you get, without additional expense, you get a service that they are managing or very small increment. Actually, AWS is not even a good example because, uh, but let's say Azure or Google, not only that you're getting it for free, actually running a Kubernetes cluster as a service is cheaper than running your own because you're not paying for control plane. But even in AWS, where you're paying for the control plane, it's 150 US a month, roughly. Yeah, it's not much. It's it's not much. It's I mean that won't even buy sodas for your for your crew during the week. The only thing problematic with that is that uh, in AWS it limits you to which options you have on a table. So for example, uh, in Google, I can say maybe I want to run run two huge clusters. Or maybe I'm going, or maybe it makes more sense for me to have hundreds more clusters. Let's say give each team a cluster. Now in AWS, I would not likely make that uh, decision because of that additional cost of control plane. So I'm incentivized to have shared clusters instead of uh, smaller individual clusters. Right. Okay. Let's come back from cloud and go back to on-prem. I put us there and now I'm pulling us back. <laughs> So we're on-prem, we're running a vendor-supported version of it. Mm -hmm. I have my people that I have trained to operate it. Mm -hmm. They've built up their skills to a point to where they leave. They leave the company? They leave the company. Because now they can go somewhere else and get more money. Now me as a business owner, I'm stuck. I'm having to rehire and trying to get somebody to help out. Now, at least I've got support. But I'm going to not be kept up to date probably for a long time. As I'm onboarding somebody to take care of. I mean, the, there's these risks that people not playing the long game just don't see. First of all, you would have much bigger problem if people leave that were in charge of something that is very specific to your company. People leaving that were in charge of your Kubernetes stuff, that's relatively easy to replace as long as people want to work in your company and you're willing to pay for that people. And that's one of the big advantages. We all know or will all know uh, Kubernetes, right? So it's a, it's a skill that is acquirable in the job market. I wouldn't be worried about that. And on top of that, I'm I'm much more worried about your people who don't want to leave. <laughs> there would be people that worry me. Do you really want to have an employee that decided that he will never leave? Because probably the decision that he will never leave or she is based on I have no opportunities outside of this company. That's how bad I am. Therefore, I'm never going to leave. You want people who want to leave. You're harshing my buzz, man. <laughs> no, you want people that... Back when I was doing consulting just for myself, the very first thing I did day one, I would sit down with the whoever had, had bought the service, like, hey, look, I am working to get myself out of here as quickly as possible because you need to be self-sustaining and move on. I don't think most employees think that way. They don't, which is a pity, and it's a bad strategy and all those things. I mean, we already spoke about it. But yeah, you want to increase your knowledge and your skills so that you, you're better at what you do. And when you're better at what you do, you get more offers from outside the company you work, and you can potentially leave. That's a good thing. Companies should be concerned how do you create an environment in which people who would normally live don't. That sounds like a great content for another episode. <laughs> Anything else about on-prem? We're not saying on-prem is bad. We're saying make sure you can't do cloud before you go on-prem. A good thing about being on-prem 
and moving to Kubernetes. So what, what I'm going to say next applies only if you're moving to Kubernetes on-prem, is that you are moving to operating things through a standard API and going to some somewhere else shouldn't be a big deal. And sooner or later, you will go cloud. Switching to Kubernetes is a good step, on-prem or not. Because it's a stepping stone, potentially. Other yeah. than OpenShift, other than OpenShift, but even with OpenShift, you can run OpenShift in cloud. So it's yeah. So you can you can go OpenShift on cloud. That's absolutely not a problem. We can have a separate episode where I would explain how that makes no sense to me. But yes, it can be OpenShift on cloud, and you should be fine. So on-prem, not completely evil, but so let me rephrase that. I don't think that on-prem is bad. I think it's brilliant if you manage to make it great. It's just that I'm yet to see on-prem that is great. That's the problem. And by 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 great, uh, we're d- defining that as everything's already a service that people just can use as if it's a big three right now. The v- definition of anything being great is always, yes, because when I compare it with something truly great, this is great as well. So what is our reference for greatness in infrastructure, that's Amazon, Google, and Azure. That's a reference. So when I say you're doing great, that means that you're doing all the things or most of the things that those providers are doing just as good or better, limited to the features that you need because you will never need everything that Amazon offers or or Azure, right? So that's great. So you're just, you as infrastructure department, you're providing just as good service as they are and just as cheap. That's another episode, man, too, oh, yeah. because people think, well, how do I do this? So let's go read an ITIL book. Let's go find a book from the 80s. No, just open up aws.amazon.com or go open up cloud.google.com. That's what you need to do. You know that you're doing great as infrastructure department in your company? If nobody calls you on the phone, nobody opens a Jira ticket, nobody asks you to create something... That is just happening. You are kind of just creating new services. Let's stop because I'll keep going on there. (laughs) Oh my gosh. All right. If you're listening right now via Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever, uh, and you can subscribe, go ahead and subscribe and leave a rating and review. All of our contact information, including Twitter and LinkedIn, can be found at devopsparadox.com slash contact. And if you'd like to be notified by email when a new episode is released, you can sign up at devopsparadox.com. The sign-up form is at the top of every page. Uh, there are also links to the Slack workspace, the Voxer account if you want to leave us a voice message for a question or comment, and also how to leave a review in the description of this episode. Anything else about on-prem? You do it if you can. Run away if you can't. Make it as good as it should be. Make it as good as it should be. Make make on prem great again. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> I I don't know. I, I there's there's a certain tipping point where on prem's pulling things out of cloud and bringing them back on prem makes a sen- makes financial sense. Oh yeah, but you know what's the difference is when you're pulling from cloud to on prem, then you're going to on prem with the with the with a different experience and different expectations. I would encourage everybody to try to go on-prem after years being on cloud. But that's a completely different thing. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks for listening to episode number 44 of DevOps Paradox.